Okay. Are we live? I think we are. Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to this Sustainable Foods Investor webinar. Thanks for thanks for coming and, and spending some of your time on this Thursday afternoon. Um, I'm Matthew Lineker, one of the directors of Growth Capital here at Snowball Effect. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. If there are any technical difficulties during this webinar, don't worry. We'll be sending around a recording later, um, so you will be able to see it in its entirety. Um, so the way that we're going to run it today is we're going to have um, three members of the Sustainable Foods team um, on the call give you a business update and presentation of the key elements of the business and its growth story, um, including those aspects that um, some investors have already had questions about since the offer went live. Um, then at the end, we'll leave about 30 minutes for your questions. So as the webinar progresses, um, I'd encourage you to submit questions um, in the ask a question area at the bottom of your screen. Um, if we're not, for any reason, able to answer any of the questions during the webinar, I'll make sure that we send um, answers around to you after the webinar. Um, so without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the three Sustainable Foods team members on the webinar. We've got Justin Lemons, the co-founder and CEO. We've got Kyron Ray, the other co-founder and the business development manager. And we've got Michelle Lemons over in Singapore, who's a member of the advisory board. So I'll just pass you over to them to give you a bit more of introduction and uh, we can go from there. Yeah, fantastic. Um, thank you, Matthew. And uh, tēnā koutou, everyone. Um, my name's Justin Lemons. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sustainable Foods. Uh, a, a beef Brief background on me, we've established half a dozen businesses over the last uh, 25 years, all successfully, and primarily in the food manufacturing and FMCG space. Uh, for myself, my drive, my passion, what gets me out of bed in the morning is really about building things. And whether that's uh, a bricks and mortar facility, whether it's a brand, a business, um, a recipe, a strategy, or actually a really strong team to actually deliver on our business strategy. That's what drives me. So a, a quick snippet on me, I'd like to cross over to Michelle for an introduction and then Kai, and then we'll carry on with the presentation. Thanks, Justin. So my name's Michelle Lemons. I'm a strategic advisor for Sustainable Based Out of Singapore. I have experience in sustainability, startups, strategic alliances, JVs, M&As, and most importantly, business model structuring and transformation. And I've worked across Asia, ASEAN, and Middle East African markets. To you, Kai. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Taranaki te moanga, ko Pātea te awa, ko Nā Raru me Nā Ruahine, me te ati awa, te iwi, ko Rei toko whānau. Nō Whanganui Atara ahau, ko Kaira and Rei toko ingoa. Ka nui te mihi, uh, ki koutou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Hello everyone, my name is Kyron Ray. I am uh, co-founder in Sustainable Foods. Uh, my background's in chefing. Some might call me a reformed chef. Um, I have 25 years experience across the hospitality and uh, manufacturing spaces. Um, I am a dad to twin, dad to uh, twin boys, um, both who have never eaten meat, a husband to a sustainable interior designer. I drive an EV, and when I'm not figuring out how to cross with proteins, um, you'll probably find me uh, on a beach doing a beach clean with my family after breakfast out, hopefully. Um, Life's busy, so thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate the opportunity to share with you. Uh, no my hi to my thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to talking. Fantastic. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Kai. Um, thanks for the comments uh, from from the uh, the audience. If we haven't got that screenshot right, please let us know. Um, so for for ourselves, we've always produced vegetarian food of our part of, as part of our product range. Um, but we're all, always looking at innovation and wanting to move forward. Um, five years ago, we started to investigate plant-based protein, and then three years ago, we actually took the opportunity to invest and move forward with that. For myself, I'm really passionate about the outdoors and the environment and the way that we actually look after ourselves. I've got four children, and a key part is looking after what we actually have today, and indeed, ideally, 
contributing to and creating a better world for tomorrow. And that's really what we're all about at Sustainable Foods. And so that provides us a good lead into what we are about to talk about. Cool. So a wee bit of a funny shot, you know, for the for the field. Um, this is what a vegetable big. Okay. Do you want to um, put the presentation up? Ah, that would certainly help. Okay. You had one button, button to push, mate. Indeed. So there we go. Rookie area, everyone. <laughs> Hopefully we've got a presentation up in front of you now. Cool. Yep. Thank you. Um, so I'll go back to my previous joke just to get a real laugh from the crowd then. Um, so, you know, taking a bit of a bit of a poke at, at um, previous uh, cuisine, um, what a vegetable burger used to look like. And for now, what one of our plant-based protein burgers actually looks like. And then touching on very briefly, oh, um, some of the other fantastic products in our range, vegetables, sausages, plant-based mints, and our hero product is our hemp chicken in the shots down below. So for us at uh, Sustainable Foods, uh, our vision is to be a leading innovator and provider of delicious, nutritious plant-based protein that helps better nourish ourselves and also nurture our planet. Our tasty food is NZ made using thoughtfully sourced natural ingredients. And we really believe in empowering conscious consumption choices without compromise. For us, if we talk about the need of why uh, we have moved in this direction, there's quite a few key factors. Um, growth in general, so population growth, we have more than 2 billion people joining the planet in the next 30 years. We also have a large um, increase in consumption of protein and a better quality of protein as part of our diets. The current uh, system is not scalable and also it's an inefficient use of resources. We've got challenges around climate change and greenhouse gases. And most recently, a very clear linkage between nourishment or diet and disease and better outcomes with a diet that includes a larger proportion of plant-based products. So for us, that talks about the need and then our approach from there. Uh, it's sustainable. Um, at our core, we embrace the field to plate approach, which drives our choices around our ingredients, production, packaging, measurement disclosure, and our ecosystems of partnerships. We really look to, to go under the umbrella or the mantle of kaitiakitanga, you know, relating to the guardianship of our resources, our people, but then backing that up by certified sourcing and measurement as part of our sustainability strategy. And uh, down the bottom, you'll note there, that uh, we have our um, sustainable development goals um, that we have picked up that are part of our strategy overall. We have four pillars that we're operating on and um, Kai will talk more about uh, our consumer facing brand, which is plant and the linkage into part of our story. But our pillars are focused on nutrition, natural, healthy ingredients, a great tasting choice, We've got to pass the taste test because if we don't pass the taste test, we don't pass go. And that's the most important thing that we can deliver. Provenance, we're proudly New Zealand made and really focused on utilising novel New Zealand ingredients uh, that also have provenance features from different regions in our country. And lastly, sustainability, where we're planet pleasing. If we talk about our consumers, we're very much focused again on cons consumption without compromise. We are targeting flexitarians and meat reducers. Our products are obviously are also suitable for uh, vegetarian and vegan eaters, um, but we're really looking for that wider population uh, sector, which depending on the statistics from each country is tending to range between 30 and 45% currently of overall population who are naming themselves as flexitarians or, or meat reducers. They come in uh, a lot of different shapes and forms. We're multi-generational from boomers through to Gen Z. And each of those groups has different reasons for making the choices of the products. But the primary purchase reasons are focused on healthier, high nutritional value products, 
better tasting choices, again, taste rules, and then ethical and kinder living choices for the environment and also for animal welfare. If we talk at a high level around our business strategy, we've achieved some fantastic things uh, in the years since we have been in market. Um, initially, our focus, growth focus has been on the New Zealand market for penetration of, of, across both retail environments, so our supermarkets, QSRs, so our quick service restaurants, the hospitality environment, and also online. We're really looking for a strong move to increase local sourcing of our ingredients and certainly want to build on our previous export experience with the pilot launch in mid-2022. We really focused on, on development of new products using novel proteins, and all of our development is actually done in-house, but we have partners outside, and we'll talk about that in, in the next slides. For us, it's certainly about building consumer awareness through experience, tasting our product, understanding our story, talking about the things that we actually stand for, and also a significant social presence. We are in the process of implementing our sustainability framework, and again, embracing a, embracing a field to plate approach as kaitiaki. And we're certainly looking to grow our experienced and motivated team to deliver on the business plan. And I'll hand over to, uh, to Kai to run us through a couple of the next slides. Thanks, Justin. So you'll notice a clever little asterisk there, and Justin has already introduced our pillars around sustainability, nutrition, New Zealand provenance, and health. Um, I think a good way to possibly talk about a further introduction to our brand is to talk about the eating occasion and how we deliver on these. So being easily translatable into any format is absolutely key. And whether that's texture or taste, juiciness that you're looking for, or the shared ritual of cooking outside on a barbecue and watching your burger deliciously caramelize on the outside. We've sourced and utilized naturally based uh, novel ingredients to deliver great tasting eating occasions and sustainable nutrition using no fillers, synthetic flavors, um, colors or preservatives. We're also contributing to work with the New Zealand Heart Foundation as a part of the Ministry of Health food reformulation group focused on sugar and sodium reduction. So our role in that conversation is not because our products are high in sodium, uh, but because we've actually found ways to reduce sodium while retaining flavor. Next slide, please. Sir. So focusing in a little bit on hemp, which has des it deserves its place as a focused novel ingredient in our products and the starting block for our commitment to migrating our ingredient source sourcing to New Zealand. Hemp being highly compatible with the New Zealand topography is the most efficient carbon sink of any commercial crop in the world. Our soon to be, re new, uh, soon to be released New Zealand hemp chicken utilizes hemp as a plant-based source of complete protein, meaning that it carries all nine essential amino acids. Over the last year, um, I have been putting our hemp chicken through its paces and have not found it coming up wanting. So whether it's a satay, as a southern fried, whether it's marinated for non-butter chicken free, uh, shredded straight into a wrap with avocado, uh, rolled into sushi, uh, sushi sorry, uh, sauteed into a pad thai, as a vegetarian, I've been eating products from this category for over a decade, and in my opinion, as a chef, this product is set to be an absolute game changer. Um, Justin, you can touch on the IP there. Yeah, certainly. So when we talk about our IP, and I, I assume we'll probably cover that later on as well. So we hold all of our own IP, um, and that is supported and developed by our in-house uh, product development team. And we'll talk about our team a little bit later on as well. One key area of our IP is uh, jointly held between ourselves, Reddit Institute, which is part of Massey University, our foremost food and agri university in New Zealand, and also with Green Fern Industries, who are a sustainable um, hemp growing company based in South Taranaki, who also um, have a venture into medicinal cannabis. So. The IP is jointly owned, um, but Sustainable Foods has the global rights to utilize that IP 
and indeed license it into different countries if that becomes part of our future strategy. All right, so thank you. Um, so delivering good sources of iron through pea um, and dietary fiber, which you don't find in animal um, sources, as well as being low in saturated fats, our protein packed products are ranged nationally into retail across over 150 countdown stores, uh, 100 plus foodstuff stores um, nationally as well. And that number is increasing daily, particularly as COVID restrictions ease and our sales team has better opportunity to get in front of buyers, uh, particularly as I'm sure you'll understand in Auckland. Um, Last year, we tended for and won against international competition, the manufacturing contract uh, to produce foodstuffs, plant-based brands under the range, um, under the PAMS brand, and that's ranged nationally as well. Um, with 40 plus years of shared experience in the food service market, um, sorry if your feed is dropping out. Um, is that okay? Yeah, so just try and speak this directly oh. to the end. Sorry. Um, with 40 plus years of shared experience across the food service space, um, we have established relationships with national QSRs like Hell Pizza, Burger Wisconsin, Tank. Um, we are the primary plant-based provider and to leading hospitality group Kapura with over 35 uh, sites, um, as well as our products featuring on the menus of prominent eateries from the Botanist Group and No Me's Lola Rouge, to name a couple. We also supply to restaurants and home delivery kits across both the North and the South Island. Our products are arranged and supported by the three main national distributors being Davis Trading, Bid Food um, and Service Foods. And as our hospitality industry uh, finds its feet again, um, we look forward to delivering good growth and, and fantastic menus with them. Thanks, Guy. So talking um, in, in some summary points around our financial results. Um, so since taking full ownership of Sustainable Foods Limited, and we were previously in a 50-50 partnership, uh, we've achieved 853% growth. Um, our growth of 266% uh, in the May to October period, uh, so the last six months, um, compared to the previous six months. Our domestic revenue channel um, is currently tracking at 75% retail and 25% hospitality over the last four months. That is skewed slightly more in favour of retail than hospitality, again, as a result of the recent lockdown and the restrictions around hospitality trading. For FY22, we've got a forecast of achieving more than $2 million revenue which includes actuals up to the end of October and currently tracking at a 28% gross margin. Um, so SFL, just to answer that question, um, is from the 1st of January, 2020. Thanks for that. In terms of looking forward uh, to our forecasts, for FY23, we're looking at achieving 6.9 million of sales at close to 31% gross margin. And the achieving further revenue growth through extending our product ranges in store and also in QSRs, so our quick service restaurants. The launch of new products in 2022 and 2023 calendar years. And we're also got international sales uh, targeted from mid calendar year 2022. Um, and 1.64 million in financial year 23. For our 2025 forecast, we're targeting 21 million in sales, uh, with domestic making up 12 million of that, and international approximately 9 million. The, um, I think just to answer that question briefly, if I've understood the question uh, correctly, the, uh, the revenue figures we're talking about is sell-in prices rather than recommended retail prices. Um, in terms of countries through international sales, we'll cover that in future slides. So a quick update on our progress, uh, some of the recent things we've achieved. Uh, so we've recently consolidated our production sites. So we had a production site in Dunedin, 
uh, which is a legacy site, and also another site in Porirua. And we've recently moved both of those in the last three months up to a world-class scalable facility on the Kapiti Coast, which is going to take us streets forward in terms of both um, uh, efficiency and scale and ability to indeed achieve our plans. We've recently were a winner in the New Zealand Artisan Awards in the Children Deli category. Uh, and to be clear, that's not just a vegetarian or vegan or plant-based products. We were the overall winner in that category in September 2021, and that was across all plant products. Um, we just had our official launch um, that we celebrated with uh, Reddit Institute, part of Massey University, and also NZ listed Green Fern Industries um, with our pioneering hemp-based chicken. And then we completed a formal welcome this week um, in the Kapiti Coast at our new facility with both local and central government. We've got excellent support here from both the Kapiti Coast District Council and in turn their Economic Development Kotahi Tanga Board um, and also had members of NZTE, MPI um, which and MBIE. So MBIE is focusing on the Kanoa scheme, MPI um, controls our accreditation but also the FSSS scheme as well which is part of our future strategy and other important stakeholders so really really good feedback and and some great people in the room as well as local businesses we've secured product ranging for a launch in q1 of 2022 with one of new zealand's top meal kit companies and then we've also recently uh just secured 195,000 in funding from callahan innovation for a $500,000 R&D project, which runs from December 2021 through to March 2023. And that project is allowed for in the financial forecasts. So our immediate plans in terms of where we're focusing is to complete our fundraising uh, in New Zealand for between $1.5 and $2 million, is to really focus on building our growth team to deliver on the business strategy is to build the partnerships, both locally and internationally, a key point. Collaboration with KCDC, so the Kapiti Council um, and the Kapiti Food Hub, and ensure that we're directly linked into the food and beverage strategy to assist with central government funding as we continue. We really want to deliver on one of our key points, our pillars of increasing localised sourcing with New Zealand provenance. We're targeting our international launch um, in a pilot market in mid-2022. We're currently in discussions with Kanoa, part of MP MBIE, on funding um, early next year. And we've also got new product ranges uh, being deli meats, cheeses, and snacks in 2022-2023. Maybe just to flesh out that area a little bit more. So we have five main product groups and it's easiest to refer to them as alternate meats. Within those product groups, we have our red meat alternates. So our burgers, sausages, mints, vegetables. Within the white meat alternates, which we currently have in hospitality and are due to launch into retail shortly, is our hemp chicken as a, a chicken or pork style replacement. We have, have our deli style meats. So looking at a bacon alternative, and also a red and white sliced meat. So fantastic for both um, home use around sandwiches, pizzas, but also in the QSRs environments. Moving on to plant-based cheeses and bridging the gap between um, uh, the current functionality of, of traditional cheese and the gaps that's there in the market. And then also moving into snacks in 2023. Just talking briefly about our team. Um, you can see myself uh, and Kai um, at the top of the page, not from a point of uh, a pyramid, more so uh, you've just heard plenty about us, so we can move on. Uh, ben Stiff is our product development manager. Uh, Ben's a great energetic young guy who's come out of the UK. He's established a couple of food-based businesses over there and has sold out of those and then come over here to join our team. Uh, Marie Spence is our shared services support manager and current CFO. She has 25 years experience um, across managing both private and corporate um, financial systems. Paul is our marketing manager, um, extensive experience both domestically and internationally for large FMCG brands. 
Shelley's our people manager uh, with 35 years experience in both private and public sectors. And Wayne is our production team lead. And then, as we've mentioned, Michelle um, is part of our advisory board. Owen Gibson from PwC in Wellington uh, has been part of our board for the last 18 months and assists on the strategy, financial and M&A side of things. And then we have external advisors, including Bushka Mitra, um, who is assisting us on extrusion strategy. So hopefully that, uh, that provides a, a good succinct um, view of uh, what we're about and what our strategies are, some of our successes to date, and also our plans for the future. So it's probably a good point for me to uh, to stop talking, although I imagine I'll, uh, I'll get asked back into the conversation again very shortly, and uh, Matthew will lead our um, Q&A sessions from there. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Thank you, Kai. Um, very, very good presentation. I think that covered a lot of points. I think one of the things that I'd like to draw out from you, if possible, is a bit more detail, a bit more information around your um, export strategy. It's a key part of your growth strategy um, going forward. Um, I feel you touched on it a little bit in the presentation, but it'd be great to get some more information, more detail around that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Matthew. And Michelle will uh, will lead the response on that one. Great. Um, look, it's difficult to cover all the things that we need to uh, in the time that's available, but obviously international strategy is a critical part of our business uh, growth story and really important for the future. So we started to research and shape and size the international markets around 12 months ago. And while you'll see really high growth, you'll hear, see high customer uptake in markets in the US, um, EU, UK. Um, what we wanted to see was what we what we saw was also increasing growth in the Asian markets. And so we decided to focus on this area for a couple of reasons. Um, primarily, it's still very early in the growth cycle for plant based protein. Um, there's a really significant growing middle class in this region, some really large population bases as well. And the customer awareness and appetites have really been influenced, whether that be even in China. Hong Kong, Singapore are definitely leading, and you're seeing startups coming through in Philippines, in Malaysia, and in Singapore as well. Most importantly is the really heavy investment that's going on both by investors in the region and plant-based, but also by governments uh, and in, in the region and, and setting themselves up. And of course, it's got high proximity to New Zealand market. And so then within that, we started working with NZT earlier this year on our first stage of uh, export market opportunity and the scan. And then we moved on to work with Catapult. Um, some of you may be aware they're a New Zealand export consulting firm. And we worked on, with them to develop a market opportunity assessment. And we did the, completed that just recently. During that profiling, we looked at Australia, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan. I'm not gonna go through the full list because you can imagine there's quite a few of them. Um, in the end, we've narrowed down Australia as the top target market for our pilot to launch next year. Um, Singapore also came through very strongly um, as it has a really attractive operating environment, but we've decided to stage that to the second one and more act as a regional base uh, for our expansion into the region. And so Australia will be our first up. We've experienced, we've, we've engaged an experienced individual who's got good, uh, good export building um, experience and we're helping, having them develop that strategy for Australia, shaping the channel and product and pricing. But we've also been able to draw on existing relationships and I think this is an important part as we build those discussions uh, across, the, across the way. Um, so distributors and consultants and New Zealand companies have also had to grow their experience we're continuing to work with NZTE um, on some reshaping for the next stages. Um, and, and what we see is uh, some of those investment profiles changing as, as we enter into um, and joining with them to do joint investment. Um, I want to keep the rest of the strategy of, of what we're launching with in Australia and what price points and that a little bit under wrap. But um, hopefully, Matt, that gives you a bit of a flavour. Yeah, no, that's great. So sort of proximity, appetite in the market um, sees you sort of focus on the um, Oceania market to start with. So when we think about um, positioning of your product in those markets and, and even in New Zealand um, and, and up against competition, how, do, how are you uh, distinguishing your, your brand, your products from others in the market? I'll keep going if you're okay with that, Justin. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds fine. Yeah. 
Great. So look, you've listened to Justin and Kai, and we've talked about our pillars. We've talked about nutrition and sustainability and, and many other things. But I, I think what we've got here is, is a really strong set of experiences around building new product taste profiles and bringing innovation and sustainability forward. So our novel ingredients like hemp are really important. Nutrition is really important to us. And of course, New Zealand made. However, it's not just about the product that we're talking about launching the same thing everywhere and not all Asian markets are the same either. And so the team's pretty experienced in shaping products that fit different taste profiles. You'll notice that uh, Kai talked about butter chicken, Thai curries, Italian meatballs, bowels, dumplings. The varietal impact that we've already bought into the product and the application of that is one of those things that we feel really confident that we're not just talking about a burger on a barbecue is great, but we're talking about a lot more than that. And cultural nuance and cultural taste variation in this part of the world, meaning um, Singapore where I'm from, is obviously very important. And so we'll be looking, we, we did that recently with our white label products. We did a lot of uh, uh, taste profile variations to fit that market. We will continue to do the same here. And I think New Zealand's curiosity with different cultural, different cuisines is really helping us in that. And then if I talk about how do we choose which market in terms of differentiation, um, clearly, uh, you know, Impossible, Beyond um, have, have launched closely into some of these markets, um, but also there's local competition growing as well, which I think is really healthy because it's showing the, the increase in market size very rapidly. But key things for us is to understand not just the, the business indicators and the market sizing, but also the customer variances around nourishment and around how appealing sustainability is or not in the decision-making process. Um, I think the one thing that's really important to recognize is while there's good information on market sizes, you know, and I, I think we, we miss talking about the size of the market, but the market projections and the KGARs are, are just phenomenal. One of the things that's really difficult to figure out is the, the market size in each of the countries. So we're using a lot of proxies to try and make that next decision. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so, I mean, you've got exceptional and extensive experience in, in product development. Um, what sort of experience do you have to execute on this sort of export strategy within the leadership team? Yeah, great question, Matthew, and thanks for that. I think um, probably there's a couple of key points in drawing in terms of uh, on the experience that we already have. Uh, so we have uh, completed exports over the last five to six years, uh, both of um, chilled and or frozen product and also shelf stable product. So we understand the systems um, and the processes behind that. And so uh, the, uh, the controls that actually need to be in place around the production of the food um, are just as stringent for, for domestic as it is for international, and that's our daily bread and butter. So around that, that side of things, I suppose the key point is we're not pre-revenue or, or a startup company, you know, who doesn't have that expertise and experience and just a wonderful idea. We're, we're well ensconced at a board level um, with Michelle's international experience and also the, the expertise that I've gained on the ground. There is some, some further steps. So we currently have an advisory board in place. Um, Michelle mentioned uh, that we also have a person working specifically on the international strategy who has um, uh, more than 15 years experience as a global expansion manager for a number of different companies as does Paul, who's our marketing manager as well, in terms of experience in both New Zealand and the Asian markets. Uh, the last part of that is as we move on to a governance board, um, we expect to appoint two new positions to that. Um, and we will be looking to, uh, to investigate and discover um, both any possible investors who have a skill set uh, that would be beneficial to bring to the table and or the partners that we actually choose uh, overall, and whether that is a market specific partner or a channel partner um, or a regional partner for ASEAN, that's something that we yet to actually conclude. And that's part of our strategy to execute in the first quarter of 2022. Thanks, Justin. <clears throat> I think we'll move on to some questions that have been asked um, uh, throughout the, the presentation. And I think um, there's a couple in there um, on similar sort of strains around 
um, being able to um, find your products in supermarkets, um, where are they? One, of the, one specific question is talking about you can only see one to two SKUs available, mostly chicken burgers in specific stores. So, so how well is it distributed around in New Zealand supermarkets? Can you improve on this? What's the next step? Yeah, um, good point. So the second to last point, can we improve on that? Look, a a absolutely, by about three or four hundred percent is the, is the goal of where we're going. I think there's um, there's a really interesting conversation in here, and it, and it specifically talks to the consumer and also the supermarkets themselves. So both internationally and also in New Zealand, the location of this product in the supermarket continues to have a question in terms of where is the best place for that. So for us, uh, and, and this also comes down to the strategy and experience that we actually have, we've talked about the different channels, both retail and hospitality and, and the QSR adjunct to that, and also online. Within the supermarkets we sell, we also deal multi-category as well. So we have representation in butchery, in shield, and also in frozen. And so for us, the, the penetration of, um, of the retail uh, environment, both in terms of SKUs, uh, but also in terms of categories, is a key part of our strategy. So at the moment, with Countdown, we um, have four SKUs in butchery. With uh, foodstuffs, we have eight SKUs outside of private label work. Um, that is fundamentally focused on, on chilled and plant-based areas and also some products in, pro in frozen. So we'll continue to push out through each of those categories within the supermarket. Um, and also as we introduce additional product groupings, like we've mentioned the deli style meats and the plant-based cheeses, those will be a group of products that's specifically focused in the chilled areas. And that also then comes down to our field team and the execution in store to grow really strongly. Possibly, yeah, adding, just, if, I, if I can, Matt, sorry, um, possibly adding to this just very briefly is, again, talking to the fact that we're not starting from scratch, our relationships exist at the top of the category level. And so we're part of a constructive conversation with category managers about the locations in store. There, there has been a bit of a, um, a learning curve or an educator role for us to be playing in this space, not just with consumers, but also help, helping retail and trading um, partners with how best to access those markets that are looking for these products. Yeah, okay. Um, I, thinking about that a little bit further, when you introduce your your hemp um, white meat alternate next year into retail, how, what's the sort of the roll up take up for that? Is that just a big blast into all the stores you're already in or is it sort of a more graduated roll up? Yeah, so it, it's going to be um, very targeted because um, for us, uh, it's certainly going to be uh, the hero product. Um, what we've achieved there is a world first um, and also assisted and, and was recognized in our top 10 listing, um, uh, sorry, on the top 10 shortlist for the Future Foods Asia uh, competition in mid uh, this year. Uh, so we were shortlisted out of a global um, group of uh over 250 companies. Our specific plans is we already have it in hospitality and we actually delivered it into hospitality six months early ahead of plan. Uh, we're named on various menus and a key part around that is um, consumer awareness. Again, the social channel is a key part of that and we've had continuous feedback through events that we've done and also tastings um, and uh, posts that we've put through that people are clamoring to actually get a hold of this product, you know? So if we kind of threw it out there and go, it's going to be the uh, the next Whitaker's, you know, sort of chocolate milk, where uh, we we're out of stock and people are clamoring for it, well, look, we'll certainly be putting in the drive behind that. Um, and the experiential side of things, which is really, really important, getting the product into people's mouths, getting them to taste it uh, and experience it, and then understand its versatility as well. And one of the, the barriers to change as well, I think is um, familiar format, uh, good taste profiles, price parity as well is really important. And we've already achieved price parity on comparable traditional proteins. Um, but you know, the, the, you could say that our product is so great that uh, we've had several um, complaints back around a, um, the hemp chicken being used in a buttered chicken meal 
where the meal has been returned because the people actually believe that there's actually real chicken in it. So we take, although it's a little bit controversial, you know, let's go with the really good feedback that it's not about, we don't like the taste, we don't like the te texture, it's, this is just, you know, this is a fantastic product. So it's a really pleasing uh, affirmation in terms of what we're doing. Yeah, that's great. And touching back on your Whitaker's chocolate milk comment, please don't do a collaboration with Lewis Road with your, <laughs> your food. Um, so if we, I, there's a few questions that have come in around um, packaging and more specifically to do with the with the hemp. So if we just sort of delve down that channel a bit. Um, on yeah. the packaging, um, the target market is, is obviously very conscious about, or majority of them will be very conscious about the environmental um, aspect. So do you have a plan to move away from single use, large plastic tray just for two burgers? Because um, that might be seen as a deterrent perhaps. Yeah, look, and, and it's a really good uh, a really good comment. We certainly have projects underway around that. I suppose um, the the entire journey around both product development and also sustainability is is absolutely what we're founded on. We talked about our framework and our metrics, um, and we have a specific metrics in place to actually continue to reduce, improve, and deliver on those um, those pillars. If we talk specifically around our current um, single-use trays, uh, so that is recycled PET in New Zealand. So we partnered up with Flight Plastics here in Wellington. Um, and so in that sense, as long as the products do get recycled, which is part of the actual system, um, it is a closed loop. So that's our first step towards that. In terms of the film use, there are compostable films and also plant-based films. Um, it's really important that all those areas are investigated properly and then actually borne out. And the barrier properties which we need in fresh food are also maintained to ensure that the food safety is there as well. So 100%, we have plans underway. We uh, have investigations around biodegradable and home compostable packaging as well. But we need to make sure that we're actually ensuring that um, the safety standards are met. And it's not a greenwashing exercise. A good example is that um, there are plastic trays and film available that have a, a plant-based component to them or cornstarch. But unfortunately, the, the total packaging material, um, whilst it contains great components like that, it can actually be 150 to 180 percent of the weight of the plastic film itself. So whilst you're getting a great marketing story, you're not actually doing for anything for sustainability and and waste and carbon footprinting. Yeah. OK. Um, so we from the outside of the packaging to the inside of the product, we think about hemp. Um, can we just touch on um, just someone's asked a question around the IP again. Um, just wondering if we can touch back on that. Um, there's no patents involved. It's all trade secrets. Um, yeah, maybe perhaps you can elaborate a little bit. Yeah, fantastic. I, I think you've nailed the head on, on on the answer with the question there, Matthew, but certainly to, to elaborate. So traditionally um, in, in food production, um, the majority of uh, IP is uh, not held by patent. Um, it is held by trade secret. And so whilst we obviously have IP in place, um, our approach to that is to protect it by trade secret across the board. And that comes from a combination of um, formulation um, and some specific um, low processing impact procedures that we have developed and then also process through to finished product. Um, so yeah, summing up, the IP, we held it ourselves, we treat that through trade secret rather than patent protection. I mean, how far ahead of you of the market are you? Is it easy for someone to jump in and, and sort of replicate, tweak recipes, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. yeah, I think I think one of the most commonly things uh, said things around here, Matt, is if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Yeah. Um, but certainly not. There's been uh, approximately three years worth of research and development alongside the Reddit Institute, Greenfield Industries and ourselves um, into developing specifically the hemp based um, chicken product. Um, it is extremely um, finely balanced and we the approach that we've taken is not to um, just throw any old thing in there for, for lack of a better uh, term but we've sourced the leading ingredients to use in these products 
um, where it's all naturally based and, and access to those other um, substrates and, and ingredients are, are not readily available at all. So there's a lot of uh, research and, uh, and, and, and uh, sourcing work that's gone into these development uh, work, the development work as well. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just um, add to that, and I, and I think there's there's different groups in the market, you know, and it probably addresses some of those questions. There's different groups of products in the market. There's uh, more the, the commodity part, the commodity replacement. Um, then there's the the getting up to a premium replacement product, and then there's that super premium, which is where the international guys are still continuing to play. Uh, we're definitely not at that. Uh, we're in that middle group. And that's where we we plan to play, and that's where that differentiation and nutrition and value add is really important. Um, and so I think it's easier to entry at the bottom end of the market, um, and there are products in that region um, to come up with something that it really is seen as an alternate swap out, quality for quality. That that part with not just the time but the investment that's also gone in and working with uh, different. Have we just talked? Thanks, well. Michelle. That's great. So it sort of leads me into the next question, which is around um, your plans to increase local sourcing of ingredients. So how um, is there a cost impact with that? Um, how how does that fare versus what you're doing now? The status quo. Yeah, good question, Matt, and and, and quite happy to answer that one. I think uh, one of the fantastic things about New Zealand, you know, is um, obviously as a food producer, uh, we have an excellent reputation um, internationally and um, both in terms of uh, quality and food safety, food security. We've got a, a, a great country that is quite long and so we've got different growing um, climates within that. We've got a really engaged um, growing community as well. Um, with uh, both agri and, and farming partners that we have. They're very keen to move forward um, with new crops, novel crops, and also crops that we can actually specifically locate to uh, you know, individual fields or areas, you know, drawing in the provenance factor. Um, the, the key point in de-risking for each of those growers is ensuring that they actually have an end use for the crop that they actually grow. And for us, we're quite clear around um, what crops we believe we will be developing in the future and also the volumes aligned to our business strategy. So it puts us in a great position. Um, coming back to uh, what we have achieved so far uh, with the focus on the hemp chicken, we've taken that uh, as a product to be ingredients less than 50% uh, New Zealand sourced to more than 70%. And we expect to keep on growing that heading through to 80 and possibly even 90%. The other key part of that is, you know, will it cost us to, uh, to change to New Zealand growing ingredients and also uh, sustainably growing ingredients? Oh, look, absolutely, that's the reality um, that will be there. Um, but the backup to that is uh, within the, the forecast model is we have allowed for efficiencies around scale and production and so we expect that our ma margins are maintained reasonably steadily throughout uh, the forecast period through to 2025 and the increased costs in uh, supply chain um, are balanced out by efficiencies, efficiencies that will be gaining through manufacturing. Thinking about those those forecasts you just mentioned um, and, and bringing that back to the ingredients, how um, how much hemp will you need um, to meet your demand? Do you have a sense of that? And, and can you get that all in New Zealand? Um, straight answer uh, to all of the questions is yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> well, sorry, there was only two, so yes and yes. Um, yeah, we, we have clear um, tonnage and uh, kg rates for what we expect to achieve for overall protein use. Um, and then that broken down into hemp as an existing product and then future proteins as well through to 2025. To answer the next question, is there's the capacity and the capability within New Zealand to do that? Uh, absolutely. Fantastic. And uh, probably the, the, the key part just to add in there, uh, so Green Fern Industries, who are our key partner in the IP, uh, we also have a um, supply relationship in terms of taking their, their hemp supply 
um, and uh, being the, the vendor and ingredient processor for that hemp into our food and other producers where appropriate. So production cost of plant protein versus animal protein, um, how does that sort of marry up? Is that, how does it scale? What's, what's the, what does it look like? Yeah, cool. I think it's, um, a, a, and again, a good question because it comes down to the metrics and the financials. And there's certainly a couple of questions that have come up in amongst that around, around margin as well and, and price parity. So, um, again, if we come back to the farmer, you know, growing uh, one field versus growing four fields, you know, the metrics immediately improve as does as we go through and uh, they actually learn about uh, different uh, cropping methods if required um, and then full utilization of product rather than as part utilization. Um, and then uh, as we sort of build on that throughout the, um, the processing side of things, um, we get into, into a situation where with the scale, um, obviously the factory, the investment in the bricks and mortar, um, we have extensive capability in the new, in the new facility to scale. Um, and we uh, can then therefore leverage um, the, the margins that we execute on by extending production run times um, and also production days. Uh, bright, shiny stainless steel likes to run 24 hours a day, whereas, uh, you know, cows and, and other bits and pieces don't necessarily like to, even though they're growing all that time. Um, and so we've got space to actually complete and, and execute on that. In terms of uh, future capital um, to actually improve efficiency, I expect we'll come back and talk around funding. Um, but we've got a current allowance in the capital plan um, for the equipment that we need to execute. And we've also got um, an allocation of both 2024 and 2025 for further capital spend, which is un unallocated to specific equipment use at this stage. Yeah, so I mean, that, that facility you've got that you mentioned there and the space you've got there. Um, uh, are there any other revenue opportunities outside your core line that you think you can utilize that space for? I mean, you're talking about white labeling already. Is there is there anything else you, you've got in, in line? Yeah, there, there, there certainly is. So um, white labeling be a key part of that. I think um, one of the things that we're all um, particularly proud of in New Zealand that, uh, you know, we are innovative and we're good. We also have fantastic access to, to natural resources. Um, we have had approaches uh, from people within New Zealand and also outside of New Zealand. The approaches from people within New Zealand are fundamentally aligned to startups um, who, you know, have a great idea. Um, the key point in terms of us aligning with them to, would be to ensure that it's not a, a directly competing product. That being said, we're really focused on actually growing the category as a whole as well. So there's a number of ways that we can actually succeed. In terms of uh, international parties, we have been approached by uh, parties both within Asia um, and in Europe to actually look at the options of uh, processing um, out of our facility and supplying uh, countries within the region. So I think there's definitely opportunities, you know, and we're very much uh, aligned to collaboration. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, um, you know, in terms of additional hubs or, uh, you know, innovation schemes. We want to be linked in directly, and that's part of our relationship with Ritten Institute um, and also Food HQ with uh, Sprout Incubator and, and Palmerston North to be able to work in and take um, their innovative and, and growth factor ideas to then actually make that part of what we're doing. And again, come back to being a center of excellence uh, around both plant-based protein and also sustainable food manufacturing. I mean, you touched... Just, sorry, sorry Andrew, just, just two seconds. Justin, you might just want to... Uh, I'll just touch on it very briefly so we can get going to the next one. Um, and that extends both in terms of what Kai and Justin have talked about in terms of growing relationships and investing in New Zealand to grow the capability in New Zealand. Um, so while we'll harness the, the hubs, actually growing the presence of the category, but also working with um, local council. So we've done quite a lot of work over the last while with um, the, the Kapiti, Kapiti Business Council. And Justin, you just might want to touch a, a bit more on that. 
on, on the work we're doing with uh, the council and uh, Kanoa. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, with gaining any central government funding, and this is a key part around that, um, that uh, it needs to be directly linked into uh, the local council and also their economic strategy. And in turn, the next spin-off of that is the food and beverage strategy. So we're currently working with them on a business case um, that will go wider afield up through the Hora Whenua, probably lower North Island, um, focused on regenerative farming and then also supply into here. But there is also a larger vision for the Kapiti Food Hub, uh, which is separately resourced and separately staffed, um, but fits into the overall picture where we expect to um, have uh, retail shop fronts, an innovation research and development centre, and part of that will also then in turn um, bring around the experience side of things where uh, it adds to that centre of excellence around plant-based protein, um, but continues to actually build the brand and the pillars as well. Growing the category, as you say, is, is, is fantastic. Um, that brings competition. So can you talk touch a bit on, on, on your competitors, um, who are the main ones, who are the key ones, what differentiates you? How can you survive against, you know, giants like Nestle? Yeah, certainly. Great question, Matt. Um, so I can probably <clears throat> speak to the domestic side of, of, of the market and, and probably revisiting collaboration within this space. Um, it's been a real privilege to be working in this uh, plant-based space. And, and one of the key reasons for that is the nature of the collaboration that exists within it, because in, invariably when you scratch the surface of the operators in this in this space you find alignment and and whether that's a ethical or an ecological or a, or a nutritional alignment you know every single person in this space has has one of those drivers and so you get talking and then you find out that actually they want you to succeed because it, you're helping them achieve their end goal so an example of that would be the work that we've done with Bacano foods in christchurch um you know listed in the Forbes um, Young Entre Entrepreneurial Group. Um, they are uh, producing plant-based meals. They are on the shelves, uh, not very far from our products. However, they are using our products within their own. And so as such, they get access to a high quality um, product produced by us without having to necessarily outlay the, 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 the CapEx to, to, to make it themselves. Um, and we benefit from the volume from them. And so there's that category growth there's that collaboration and there's working with competitors in the space because we're, we're all in this for, for, for a greater good reason as well. That's domestically. Internationally, um, some very well-known players, but I'll throw it back to you, Justin. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Guy. I think probably just a couple of points to, to add to that is, um, you know, for domestic, uh, our driver is very much local rather than imported. Um, and we'll touch on price at the end of this as well. Um, a lot of the older products, and products in this category um, haven't been a great experience either on taste or on texture. We're actually delivering really strongly on taste and texture. But a key part in terms of standing out amongst the crowd is uh, what our brand stands for and coming back to the pillars of nutrition, um, sustainability uh, and New Zealand provenance. You know, a, a big part of that for us is actually engaging with our consumers and our community to ensure that we actually develop that loyal brand following. Again, we talked about multi-category, um, and so that's the strength that we have, as well as multi-product groups as well. Um, so we believe that uh, we're in a great position as a result of those things and the unique ingredients that we actually utilize um, to stand out from the crowd. And, and also addressing the pricing side of things, uh, it was mentioned in an earlier question, uh, we have already positioned our products at a price parity. Again, we, we won't be in a um, commodity category because of the, the quality of our products and the innovation, and we will continue to lead and be at the front, nor will we be at super premium. So we know that shift is coming, and we've already executed on that in terms of price parity, and the forecasts actually include that. Internationally, I think the real key point is... Um, Obviously, everybody wants to go out, you know, and succeed on the world stage with great furor and, you know, uh, be the best brand that's ever been. I think we uh, we have a little bit of uh, seasoning and experience behind us as well. 
Um, we have had a lot of approaches over the last 18 months and we have put those aside because we want to ensure that when we actually do go to market, we have selected our market well, we've selected our channel well, and then also selected our products accurately and tailored those to local markets. So when we actually go and execute in those markets, we, are, we will be well focused um, with the resources that we actually take there. And a key part of that, coming back to the competition, um, that will be the assessment in terms of where we go, um, but also uh, what's our point of difference. Hemp is a key standout at this stage and amongst that as, as a hero product, again, a world first. Um, but then as we move on, the continual use of novel proteins, standing on our pillars of sustainability and nutrition, and also New Zealand provenance with that strong food uh, trust story and food security. Thanks, Justin. <clears throat> I'm conscious it's been an hour now um, on the webinar, but I, I'm keen to answer a few more of these um, sort of financially focused questions before people start um, ducking off. Um, just to reiterate, if any question doesn't get answered in this webinar, we'll, we'll answer it. Um, we might just keep going um, and then we'll send the webinar recording around. If we don't get to anything, we'll just send out answers to those that haven't been answered. Um, there's a, uh, a question here specifically around one of the um, loan repayments that you intend to uh, uh, pay utilizing um, the, the cap raise um, around the 490k um, short-term working capital loan. Can you just give a bit more clarity around that? I believe that part of it's going to get paid off um, and the rest out of cash flow later, but um, perhaps you could extrapolate. Yes, yeah, certainly, Matthew. And, and it's probably easiest to talk about um, all, all three loans that we have in place. Um, so the funding that we got, which is uh, 490k, that was a short term bridging uh, finance loan. Um, and so essentially, it's already overdue on the payment terms. We have negotiated extended terms on that. And uh, the terms are pay repayment of 100k in this first uh, raise. And then with the balance of 390k to be paid out um, in 2024. The other two funding parts that we have in place, uh, we have asset finance of 150K and then also a 300K working capital loan that have been secured in recent months. Um, and the intention with those two loans is they'll be rolled together into uh, one facility in mid 2022 uh, and they will be secured through a traditional um, a traditional lender, um, you know, one of the primary banks uh, we've also got investigations underway around um, alternate financing around that as well. Thanks, Justin. Um, there's questions here around net margin. So um, what's the net margin are you targeting in 2025? Um, that, I can answer that, it's 11%. Yep, 11 I was going to say 11, 11 to 12 percent yep. Yeah. Um, now let's have a quick look, um, sticking on the financial theme, um, uh, revenue splits between sort of your white label and your own brand, um, they'd like to truly evaluate the strength of the plant brand. So, you know, how much does it each take up? Yeah, certainly. So, um, within the, the channel split, um, as we mentioned, 75% is in retail and 25% is in hospitality, currently skewed by the recent dropout of hospitality volume. Um, within retail, the, the white label makes up around sort of 35 to 40% of that uh, revenue income. That being said, that's early stage and we've got extensive uh, growth uh, of the plant brand as well. Uh, by the end of um, uh, FY 2023, that private label um, component comes down to between 10 and 15% of overall revenue. And um, someone's asked a question about product pricing, which sort of leads on from that. Um, they find it quite pricey in the supermarkets. Do you envisage the price coming down? I, I know you're talking about being solidly in that middle category of, of premium, but do you see any flex there? Yeah, I, I certainly um, do see that changes will come about there. I suppose one of the, the key things is within the modelling is we've allowed for uh, CPI increases around some of the input costs. That being said, around revenue, we haven't allowed for increases. Um, in terms of do we see pricing coming down? Um, again, 
with our products, we have them aligned with comparative traditional protein. Um, and, and so in that sense, we think we're already at that level, um, whilst other products are not, you know, and I suppose calling out a couple of products really just to make sure that we're talking, uh, you know, apples and apples or, or burgers and burgers in that sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you look at a Beyond Burger, a two-pack that's on the shelf, um, they will be retailing between $13 and $14. Um, oh, and, nice. yep. oh, no. and for the same pack size, we already have them on shelf for $7.99. Um, and uh, also looking at promotional deals within that. So at, in our view, we've already worked to address that price parity uh, to a good level. Again, comparative to... Um, products both in terms of fat levels because, uh, you know, acknowledging again that we're focused on nutrition and sustainability as part of our two key pillars. Yeah. And what's the, mar what's the margin differential between um, or how close are the margins between retail and, and quick service restaurants? All oh, right. So um, in, uh, in hospitality, traditionally the margin is better. <laughs> Um, because obviously with, uh, with retail, um, there is, uh, extra bricks and mortar, you know, involved in that and service costs and promotional costs. Um, whereas your service delivery into, uh, food service is, um, is, is lower and also the wastage in food service is lower. So on the whole margins into food service is better, um, and that's also the, the best opportunity, which we've already leveraged um, as part of our long-standing relationships uh, to get products in and also uh, naming uh, opportunities on menus, which then is part of that consumer education. So then when they cite the product in the retail environment, it's an easy transition and recognition. Yeah, right. And in, in terms of your cash flow, um, when do you envisage being cash flow positive? Sure. So uh, our cash flow turns positive um, in the second half of 2024. Right. Um, manufacturing wise and, and your, you know, your, your forecasting, what sort of capex is required? The questions come in. Can, can new manufacturing cope with FY25 demand or is more capex required? Uh, we're comfortable at this stage that uh, with the CapEx uh, plan that we have in place, which is just over a million dollars in this first stage, and then we've got two further allocations in there of uh, 200K in each uh, 2024 and 2025. Um, so we're comfortable at this stage with what we know and what we've planned around that we do have sufficient allowance in there. So what's preventing you from, or what might prevent you from achieving these targets? What's what's the biggest risk you envisage and, and how do you mitigate those risks? Yeah, sure. Great, great questions. Michelle, do you want to come to that? <clears throat> You're on mute, Michelle. You're on mute still. There we go. Great. Sorry, Matt. Yeah, come off. And so you're talking about the greatest risks to achieving yeah, that's right, it? Yeah. Yeah. Great. And so, look, um, I, I think there, there's a couple for us. We've touched on some of the various things, but obviously, delays to the capital raise is probably the biggest one that we're facing at the moment. Um, you know, we've got a lot of plans, whether that be around development, scaling, um, which needs some injections of, of funding. And so while we have access funding in terms of mitigation around asset financing and working capital, um, we've also just commented on the Callahan Innovation um, Grants and also working with NZTE, so they will help fund some of the export. And also working with, um, with CAPD, we need that capital raise. So that's probably one of some of the biggest risks in scaling. Competitors, you're gonna say, is always a risk, right? Um, and is the category gonna grow as quick as we think it's gonna grow? Um, and I, I have to say that we think the, the CAGR, you know, for the industry is very high. Um, the points of differentiation that we have is very high. And actually increased competition at this stage of the market is, is a good thing. It's actually helping grow the market. And that's going to be especially so as we enter the Asian markets. Um, we've, we've, again, position, price position, we think well. And our focus on product innovation, we think will uh, help us with, uh, with competition. 
as well as the brand. We've received such positive feedback about the brand and the positioning of it. And then I think the, the last one of the three that I'll call out is the delays um, to international market entry um, and the challenges um, and the timing around that. And so one of the, the key hires that will happen outside of following the capital raises around the international resourcing um, uh, to get that up and running as quickly as possible and secure our entry into, a, into the Australian market. Like anything, um, experience is, uh, is the good teacher. And so while we've worked in the Australian market for and exported, so getting in and getting up and running uh, is not something that's new to us. Bringing this plant product uh, to market is something that's new. And hence why we'll be looking to leverage both the experience of the team and also NZT and also the new hire. So that's kind of three key areas. And presumably COVID has impacted great inbound for your in ingredients. Um, how how, when you export um, to Australia, Asia, um, are you going to be able to maintain margins with the freight costs, et cetera, et cetera? Are you, are you always going to manufacture in New Zealand? Yeah, good question. And I think there's there's sort of two or three questions in there in that sense, Matthew. Um, so, you know, yes. on the on the supply and logistics side, um, I, I think the good thing is we're not alone <laughs> because the entire world is suffering exactly the same thing about that at the moment. You know, um, and and look, there are there are challenges in supply, both in terms of timing um, and availability. But that's part of our focus in terms of moving to uh, to New Zealand provenance ingredients. Um, in that sense, in in terms of maintaining margins, um, look, I, I think it's a key part. And this is where we really look to our experience around that, and we draw in the last twenty five years. We um, have worked we understand the retail pricing points you know the, the margins on the way through and where we need to pivot and adapt to that well that's part of what we actually do you know the strength that we hold within the organization um and also at the advisory board and to the appointed um uh, governance board the last part of that question is you know do we intend to uh always manufacture in new zealand uh certainly for the near future that is part of our plan um, you know, in near future, let's say, you know, 18 to, to 36 months. If there's reasons in amongst that that we need to pivot, either through opportunities around international partnering, um, you know, uh, or other reasons, then that certainly will become part of the strategy that we will consider. And, and within that, uh, you know, uh, different market conditions as well. Um, what we may look at doing in a month that is part of the strategy that we've identified to maintain that unique selling point is whilst it may be manufactured in another country, it will still have New Zealand ingredients in it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Justin. I'm looking down the question list. Um, we'll do a couple up the top, but a lot of them I think we've already covered. Um, if we sort of jump back into the ingredients, um, there's a question here around, um, would you look at other sustainable protein non-vegetarian sources such as New Zealand mussels. Okay, cool. I, I can answer that one very succinctly. So uh, Sustainable Foods is 100% a plant-based protein company. Good answer. Um, if we then think back a bit again about hemp, um, questions coming around around the growing of hemp um, and that it requires it seems to require a lot of fertilizer inputs. Is this, is this sustainable? That's yeah, so specifically with our sources of hemp grown up in Hawara and down near Lake Hawara and Otago, um, they are accessing um, sustainable sources of fertilizer. Um, they have got a um, project underway with a local uh, chicken producer, if you will, to use their uh, byproduct, um, which is fundamentally the scrapings and regenerating that into a fertilizer. So um, the hemp uh, supply into our products is actually New Zealand's first uh, certified carbon zero hemp grower. Um, and so, yes, in, in, in regards to requirements and inputs for the, the, the sourcing of that ingredient, um, add to that the fact that it's been processed by a private hydroelectricity plant um, and you've got some pretty serious credentials. That's great. Um, Let's just have a look at some questions. Um, we've done so the hemp one. 
talked about the price coming down in the supermarket. Um, pilot. The products still through to other cultures we've done. Um, storage temperature for um, most of the finished products. They're, talking, they're asking freeze or refrigerate or green temp. Yeah, cool. Um, and it definitely de depends on product group as well. Um, so some key points within that is that uh, the product is produced and frozen and stored frozen. For uh, the hospitality environment, it is uh, distributed and received frozen and then usually stored, you know, in each individual outlet frozen as well prior to use. With, uh, with the retail side of things, um, again, produced, stored frozen, distributed frozen, and it's also distributed chilled. Um, so there is a process uh, that's utilized standard industry practice uh, that is uh, freeze thaw. We're at the point of controlled thawing um, and it will be provided with a, a fresh chilled use by date um, and sold in a chilled environment. So in, in the retail environment, it can be sold either frozen or chilled depending on the outlet uh, and, and the country as well focusing obviously on shelf life and sell through rates as well. Um, the other product groups that we talked about in terms of deli style meats, uh, cheeses, and also um, snack products. Uh, it's our intention that the snack products will be shelf stable. Um, and then coming back to, to other opportunities within that, uh, we are currently investigating uh, products that in turn can render the pro uh, some of the, the alternate meat products shelf stable as well a key point in amongst that though is uh, consumer experience and desire um, and and the trust in behind that uh, obviously linked to to animal protein that sits on a on a stable shelf um do the que same questions and trust levels exist for a plant-based protein as well so we're, we'll uh, we'll identify those processes and work through them through some consumer engagement and i expect it will be market specific as well um, the, talking about market specific, is, is your branding packaging going to change for overseas markets? Because the, the, the question is, the current packaging doesn't leverage the strong New Zealand brand. It's got a traction worldwide. Just repeat the last part of that question. Sorry, Matthew, it just went faint. The, the comment is that the current packaging doesn't leverage the strong New Zealand brand. It's gaining traction worldwide. So are you going to change or adapt your packaging to the overseas market? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's a great point. The primary brand itself and the pillars remain um, in terms of taking that product forward, then yes, that will be part of our consideration. Great. Just looking at a few of these questions, I think we've touched on um, most of them now. Um, we've covered most of them. One here specifically around the process side of, of the food. You mentioned it's not ultra processed as this is an issue for many and, and trying to reduce processed food. How do you gain the needed comfort on that while staying tasty? Yeah, and I think it's a good question. Um, I suppose the, the key point uh, in amongst that is not giving too much away, but also being honest about the way that we actually answer that as well. Um, so we are innovating, we have been innovating, and we're going to continue to innovate. And so um, I expect what we're doing now, you know, will certainly include some different factors as we go forward. Um, is there a, a percentage of um, uh, ingredients that may have a, a, an additional level of processing in them? Certainly. I think the approach that we take though is that we're about doing more good rather than less bad. And so if a product is, is fundamentally 90% better for you than other forms of consumption, then we're focusing on that 90% better rather than the 10% um, that may not be there um, as, a, as an excuse to not change behaviour. Um, but it's certainly, it's a really relevant point and part of what we'll continue to do as part of our innovation and development. Possibly, um, possibly of, um, sorry, Michelle, you go. Okay, I'll go. Um, possibly feeding into that, um, what we can achieve today with naturally based food technology is streets ahead of what we could even do five years ago. And so what was traditionally approved, um, achieved using sorbates and sulfites and synthetics, we're doing with cool ferments, we're doing with yeasts. Um, and so, look, I'll, I'll, I'll throw a, ch a challenging question back to a question. Um, if anyone's eaten an uh, animal-based sausage, 
and uh, worried about what's in a plant-based one, um, they shouldn't be. Um, so <laughs> the, the degree of processed uh, ingredients that is widely used in most commonly consumed foods um, do not exist in our products. And, and yes, there's that educator role to play there. But along those lines, there, there are new ways of looking at food. So as a chef, a sausage needed to pass the taste to it or it needed to snap, it needed to retain juiciness. And so we went to the ends of the world and we found a sausage casing that is based on seaweed. So there you go, you've got fantastic naturally based uh, food technology made from seaweed versus the intestine of the pig. Just throwing that out there. And given you've got the floor, Kaya, there was a really great question about um, the poor quality of cheese out there. Um, and this leads right up your alley of product innovation as well. And are we, you know, how are we looking to develop that? If you wanted to quickly touch on. Yeah, look, I think um, one of the primary drivers for developing all of our products has been um, my eating experiences, if you will. Um, not the sole, not the sole drivers, but certainly I felt that we could and can and are doing something better than was available in the market, and and the fact that we can do it within New Zealand. So, whatever we make. Going back to a sausage, it can't be an indeterminate tube of generic texture and indiscernible flavour. We need texture, we need definable flavours, we need that sausage to stand up to your charcoal barbecue so you don't feel like the poor cousin around the barbecue while your meat-eating friends are looking at you saying, why would you? Um, you know, our sausages caramelise, they, they, they grill, they char, they do all of those things. And the same thing will be apparent with cheese. And so... There's some, there's some amazing things that we can achieve with, um, again, not giving away too many things, but if we use fermentation and um, plant-based milks. And, 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 and again, the relationships and the network that we've built in sourcing quality naturally-based food technology, we will get to. Um, again, we won't bring it to the market unless it's better than what's there. Right. Um, let's so um, there's a question around not being able to find the, the product in Wellington. Um, can I suggest that um, on your website, Justin, there's a there's a store locator, isn't there? So people can go onto that. It's plant, P-L-A-N hyphen T dot earth. Um, so there's a store locator on there. You can find um, which stores are stocking it there. You just send us your address. Yep, send the address. Local. Um, uh, so I suppose a, a plug on that front, and obviously it's it's already gone out, but uh, we'd love to arrange an investor tasting in Wellington. And so, if you are based in Wellington, you know the opportunity to get together is there. Um, you know, ping in the messages to Matthew and go from there. Yeah. So, just while while we've got that that point, my my email is matt at snowballeffect.co.nz. Um, so, if you've got any questions that you you think of after this webinar that you want to ping over, I can make sure they get answered equally. Send your address. We'll figure out um, where you can get the stuff, uh, get the product from. Matt at snowballeffect.co.nz. Um, I'm just trying to get a question. Uh, okay, I'm not sure if this has been asked, but how is evaluation set, and what's the long-term exit strategy for investors? Yes, yeah, certainly, and, and a key question, of course, because it's a, it's a financial investment at the end of the day, you know, as well as ensuring that we actually deliver on the triple bottom line as well. Um, so the, the valuation's been set with a revenue multiple of 2.81 uh, based on our revenue in the 2022 financial year. Um, and that hasn't been plucked out of the year. Obviously, we've had long, extensive conversations with, uh, with people in the industry, um, private houses and also Snowball um, as well. In terms of moving forward, um, around dividend side of things, we will continue to invest strongly in the next couple of years. Uh, leading through to the period that we are cash positive uh, and creating opportunities for either A, dividends at that point or further returns, uh, further investment. Um, in terms of what an exit looks like, uh, we um, believe that both domestically and internationally, there will continue to be strong interest in this um, and innovation. Obviously, a great way for some of the larger companies to grow is through acquisition. Um, and that will be an area for the board to be uh, seriously looking at in years three to five for um, options around divestment, if that is part of the plan strategy and the best thing to do. 
Great. So touching on that, you mentioned the board. Um, I think we've touched on it before, but worth reiterating. Do you need to add more to the board leadership team to create the levels of growth you need or want? What are your current uh, staff turnover rates? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so probably um, two questions. Um, so in terms of staff turnover rates, uh, I think in the last uh, 18 months, we've had uh, one. So that's looking good so far. Um, and, you know, uh, as always, it, it's a positive step forward. <laughs> well, not as always, but we certainly we've moved forward well on that front. Um, do we, uh, sorry, I, I, was, I was leaning to the side. Was that me? I was leaning to the side there. My apologies. Um, you two need to scoot back <laughs> so we can see you both. There you go. Nice and loving. Love it. Um, in terms of uh, leadership and management team, uh, as Michelle referred to before, one of the first appointments is an international manager. Then we have additional positions targeted of um, uh, international support. Um, and then supply chain, uh, we have a, a product manager whose uh, responsibility will be focusing on new product delivery um, outside of the development side of things and also the margin aspects. Um, a new CFO coming on board. So we have a full table um, and timeline planned around building that team. From the board side of things, uh, we have allowance for either a four or five person board. Um, the board for the first 18 months will comprise of myself and Michelle, and Kai will come in after that term. Um, and so the two or three other positions will be looking for uh, people who obviously bring to the table significant skill sets and or networking relationships opportunity uh, that may or may not be um, a substantial investor and or one of our international partners. Great. So in terms of the governance structure, you've got plans for that. You've got um, post this capital raise, you're, 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 you've got a plan in place for that. So that's, that's great. Um, uh, uh, one question that's at the top, which I think we've already touched on, but is talking about the products appealing to other cultures and international markets. Michelle, you mentioned, um, you mentioned, you spoke about that a little bit, but, but perhaps let's just touch on it again. So the question is, um, how would you develop your products over time to appeal to other cultures and international markets? Burgers, sausages, and mints are somewhat Eurocentric, in my humble opinion. Do you have plans to make these appeal to other cultures? So you spoke about, you know, butter chicken and, and, and tar. You, you, yeah, just talk about that a little bit more, please. Kai, your best place to do that. Why don't you jump in? No problem. Um, so I'd argue that mince sort of lends itself to a number of different cuisines. Um, I know certainly from a, a home perspective that nachos uh, features regularly on my uh, slightly lethargic Friday night menu. Um, but we work with a number of other manufacturers around New Zealand as well, and that fits for a number of different formats, including um, there's a dumpling manufacturer in Wellington um, who's looking to use our chicken within that. And so if I was to describe our mince or our chicken um, as, as something, it's, it's a blank canvas ready for people to put their mark on. Um, chicken is the most commonly consumed protein in the world. It has all sorts of different uses. Um, like I've said, um, my background's in chefing and I have thrown everything at our hemp chicken. Um, I have stewed it, I have fried it, I have battered it, I have uh, beaten it, sliced it, cooked it, sautéed it, add, added every single ingredient you can possibly to a, a process to it um, that you can find in your kitchen at home. Um, and it has performed fantastically. So um, whether it's within an Asian setting, a, a, a European setting or, or you know, in any other type of cuisine, I'm more than confident that that stacks up. Um, within now, um, you know, to talk about a complicated process, marinating overnight in a plant-based yogurt to then um, add to a, a home roasted masala mix before grilling it and coming up with a plant-based butter tandoori chicken. That's what this product is capable of doing it whilst remaining tender and moist in the middle. And yeah. I think I touched on it, if I just used that, what we find with both the core product and then also the extended product is it's all about experience and all about that first taste. And so part of our plans really now are starting to ramp up around our social media and around our um, getting different chefs and different restaurants. You'll notice that we're distributed 
we can do we can do better but we've made some great progress on distribution but also bringing those to life where people can actually see that you are using um, chicken that is you know plant-based in a Thai's chicken curry and so helping people see that through short clips and short videos um, is going to become more and more of our um, penetration and we've done really well on our social over the, the last while and increasing the penetration and uptake in that and that will continue to be um, a, a real point of investment for us. Yep, um, if anyone's fluent in Instagram, which I learned how to speak last year, um, you can definitely see a couple of videos there of uh, burgers being sliced in half and releasing lovely juiciness or um, some footage of our chicken being um, cooked and pulled apart and you can see that with smoked paprika and olive oil and it's just it's really important that it's usable and usability in those eating occasions and delivering those um, is, is what, what, what we're doing with our products. Thanks Kai, that's, that's really great and I can see a comment coming in talking about seeing the recipes on social media would be great so that's, that's great you, you made that point. Um, I reckon we wrap it up after one last question. Um, we've, we've answered most of the ones that are outstanding already, but there's one that's in there that we haven't touched on a huge amount, which is around online sales. So the question is, the online forecast seemed low compared with international and local growth. What's the logic for this? Is online seeing more as repeat purchase? Uh, just for an answer there, conservative. Yeah. Okay, so uh, being a real key point, we we significantly expect online sales to be strong in a B2C uh, format. Um, and also part of the model that we talked about was also outlet shop as well. Um, and so for us, uh, I think the real key point is, you know, Kai talking about all the fantastic flavors there. Um, and then we come back to our product groups, you know, and, and if we break down the basics, you know, would we expect people to be jumping online and just ordering, you know, a, a tray of burgers? No, you know, of course they can. Uh, but if we talk about the product groups of the red meat, the white meat, um, the, the sliced meats, plant-based cheeses, um, and the snack products, you know, we expect it to be a full basket that will grow over time. And we expect that to be a really strong area. So succinctly, we think it's going to be great. We're conservative in our forecast because at the moment we haven't got that channel running directly ourselves. We're going through other uh, parties, but also that online purchasing. A key part is linking into the uh, the meal kit providers, and you know we've already got um, a couple on board, and we've got some good significant successes there next year as well. Thank you, Justin. Well, I think we'll leave it there, everyone. Thanks so much for um, attending today. Um, and thanks, Justin, Kai, and Michelle for um, answering those questions very well and for the presentation. I think everyone's got a lot out of it. Like I said, if there's anything more that anyone wants to ask but didn't quite grasp, then please do send me an email to matt at snowballeffect.co.nz and I'll make sure that gets answered for you. Um, in a few hours, we'll start to send around the, um, the recording of the webinar. Um, so if you missed anything or you want to pass it on to anyone, please do. Um, we will send it around shortly, like I said. So without further ado, um, thanks again, and um, I think we'll leave it there. Hey, sounds great. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Matthew. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. All right, Todd Zines.